Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening to everyone joining us today and welcome to today's webinar. Today's talk is entitled GPC, a novel statistical method for outcome analysis and reporting of prioritized composite endpoints. My name is Kelsey Brown and I am the Director of Medical Writing Solutions at Transperfect Life Sciences in London and it's my pleasure to be your moderator for today's session. Today's event will run for approximately 60 minutes and then that does include time for Q&A at the very end. This session is designed to be interactive and works best when you're involved so please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers by using the questions chat box in your control panel and we'll answer your questions during the Q&A session. If you do require uh, assistance at any time, just contact me at any time um, by sending a message using that control panel. And at this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. And just, just a note, this session will be recorded, so it will be made available to you on the IDDI website for viewing within 24 hours after the webinar is complete. This event is proudly hosted by the International Drug Development Institute, IDDI. IDDI is an expert center in biostatistical and integrated eClinical data services provider for pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies in several disease areas, including oncology and ophthalmology. IDDI optimizes the clinical development of drugs, biologics, and devices thanks to proven statistical expertise and operational excellence. Founded in 1991, IDDI is headquartered near Brussels, Belgium, with the U.S. Center of Operations in Raleigh, North Carolina. And now I will pass it over to Dr. Mikhail Debacher, our Senior Research Biostatistician at IDDI, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kelsey. Um, it's my pleasure to, to welcome everyone to um, yet a, another IDDI webinar. And um, before I, I pass um, the ball to our speaker today, Johan, um, in parallel to introducing him, I just wanted to well, tell everyone about how we uh, got to know him actually. So as you may know, IDDI and in particular its founder Mark Beres uh, will have it at heart to promote research around statistical methodologies for clinical trial. And in that context, IDDI was at the origin of a, of a research consortium that started in 2018. Uh, it was just a, a collaboration uh, of industry and academic partners centered around the statistical methodology known as Genoa's Day West Comparisons or GPC as Johan represented today. And so one of the key members of this research was Johan, who actually did his PhD on the topic. So there are, in fact, very few people as involved in the topic as, as him. Um, Johan has just made, well, numerous valuable contributions to, to the domain and is still today one of the, uh, I would say, driving forces around the development and also the use of, of GPC. So his keen interest in, in getting the method out there, um, namely in, in rare diseases and, and cardiovascular trials is, well, I can really see, truly um, inspiring. And that's what brings us this to today, given our joint interest in this uh, new statistical tool. Johan's current position is in academia, as he's a researcher expert at the University of Hasselt in Belgium. We thank him already warmly for his presentation today, and Johan, well, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Michiel, for uh, the introduction and also IDDI for the opportunity to uh, to speak uh, to you all. And as uh, Michael indeed has uh, uh, has introduced, it has been a, a privilege, uh, um, to be honest, to be able to work also with uh, with Mark and and you, Michael, on uh, on this GPC uh, methodology. Um, and today. Um, I would uh, want to give you a bit more of information about the research that we did also together with uh, IDDI, mainly uh, in the use of GPC in uh, cardiovascular uh, trials. So you should be able to see my screen now, if all goes well. Yes. All right. So I'll give you uh, a bit of the highlights of what we want to, um, at least what I want to uh, tell you uh, about today. Um, so we'll give you a bit of information on, or background information on cardiovascular clinical trials and how that is actually um, a bit uh, hallmarked by the use of multiple outcomes, uh, most uh, notably composite outputs. Uh, outcomes and uh, how GPC, of general pairwise comparisons, can be an interesting statistical methodology 
um, for analyzing these composite endpoints. Now, I have to tell you um, that um, perhaps people here present today, um, they may know uh, GPC perhaps in a different context, um, namely the win ratio, which has gained a lot of traction in the cardiovascular area the last couple of years. Um, but it is only one of the treatment measures of GPC. Um, and so I wanted to point you out what the difference are uh, between different GPC effect measures. I think it's very relevant, uh, certainly for applications in cardiovascular clinical trials. And uh, finally, I will end with some uh, opportunities and challenges that I see uh, of the, the use of general paywall comparisons in cardiovascular trials. And so cardiovascular trials um, have been hallmarked mainly by um, in the early years on uh, by looking at the effect of mortality of course cardiovascular events um, they often lead to mortality and so initially in clinical trials the main clinical outcome of interest was mortality now luckily for all of us um, the clinical practice improved over the years and so you see here um, over the years a decline um, in the number of deaths in cardiovascular area uh, over over the years. Now that is good for patients, for all of us, um, but it is less interesting, of course, for clinical trials. Because that meant, for example, in um, heart failure trials, that mortality in the control arm decreased um, in over 30 years from 35% to 10%. So there's a fourfold decrease in your control arm. So as you all know, if, if we have less events and we have an event-driven uh, outcome analysis, then of course that means that we need a lot more patients and so more costly and longer duration in time uh, of a clinical trial. Now, in order to compensate this, then uh, from the years 80, uh, 90 of last century onwards, they tried to, um, they combined different endpoints in composite endpoints. So next to mortality, um, also additional events are combined into composite endpoints. For example, if, um, so Tan et al, they have uh, looked into the literature, in the past literature, and looked at uh, the Lancet New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA journal specifically, and looked at um, the use of composite endpoints in clinical trial data that has been published. Uh, and you see there over the years, there's, there's a sharp increase, um, more or less around the same time that there was a decrease of mortality uh, in the general population. Um, and they've seen that mostly in these composite endpoints, there are at least three different outcomes present, uh, which mostly also includes uh, mortality, which is what you see on the, on, on the right slide. And so composite endpoints of more than one outcome in the analysis, the primary analysis of a clinical trial in cardiovascular trials is quite common since quite uh, a lot of years. Now, at the same time of this rise of the use of composite endpoints, they were also um, raising concerns about the uh, standard methodology which these composite endpoints uh, are being analyzed, um, meaning the time to first event. So of these composite endpoints, we look only at the first event and more specifically at the time that its first event occurs. So that means, for example, if we have two subjects in a clinical trial, one in the experimental arm, which is the top uh, patient, and one in the control arm, which is indicated by, by the C, um, we see that the control patient died at month three in the trial, while the experimental subject had uh, only a non-fatal um, myocardial infarction at two months. And so that means if you look at the time to the first event, that means that the subject in the experimental arm is doing worse than the patient that died. Now, I think you would agree with me that clinically that does not make sense and that um, you would all choose to be the first patient rather than the second one, if, to, if you have to choose between them. And so there is, a um, at this balance um, between fatal and non-fatal events in the time to first event analysis, which, which we should be able to, uh, to, to correct to have a more clinically, um, in, like more clinically intuitively interpretation of the results that we have. Next to that and related perhaps also to that is that we can only take account of one event per subject. 
So we take only the first event and we only take the time to the first event. So in another example, we have two subjects who have an event at exactly the same time at six months, only the control subject now has multiple events and the end dies. Now, if we only analyze the first event and look at the time of the first event, then that means that those two, two subjects are treated as being equal. So they do equally well on the treatment. Uh, again, I think you would agree with me that the control subject here is doing definitely worse than the experimental subject. Next to that, we're also limited um, in composite endpoints with the type of data that we can use. So very often that is survival data. Um, we can only take survival data into account or also um, often in composite endpoints, we have uh, binary outcomes, for example, also. But we cannot combine different endpoints. For example, if we're interested in the frequency of hospitalization, the quality of life or a six minute walk test, um, these are count data or categorical data um, or continuous data even. Uh, we cannot combine them with um, survival data. Um, and that is a limitation. So perhaps the treatment that we want to evaluate has an effect on a continuous account or a binary outcome uh, that we need to be able to combine with survival data. Finally, the time to first event is often a bit of a black box. Eh? Something comes out of there, uh, but we don't know what the treatment effect is on the individual components that we have within a composite endpoint. And so we'd also like to know what the treatment effect is on each of these uh, components uh, in the composite endpoint. Because very often um, we as well have um, non-fatal events which are more frequently present uh, and often occur also um, in time uh, earlier than fatal events. So in the end, the treatment effect that we see or the effect that we analyze is mostly driven by the clinically less severe events. And we want to know um, the contribution of each of the components to the overall effects. And finally, the moment that we have more than one outcome, then of course there is a correlation between these events. Um, and we're not really sure about time to first events, how correlation is captured um, within these uh, endpoint analyses. So these were initially the comments that people raised uh, around the use of a time to first event analysis of composite endpoints. And um, more or less also at the same time, people have started to look at different methodologies that allow to circumvent or correct um, one or several of these comments. Um, and so I've indicated here in, uh, in, in um, the colors in green and red, um, some of methodologies that were suggested uh, to improve time to first event analysis of composite endpoints uh, and indicating with these colors uh, which of these concerns that were raised um, are covered by these novel methodologies. So first of all, we have some extensions of uh, Cox proportional hazards. So rather than taking time to the first event, now we can take more or multiple events per subject into account. So these extensions are known as uh, Anderson Gill methodology or Wiley and Weisfeld, um, Prentice William Peterson, and so on. And these are rather old methodologies uh, as well. But again, we're still limited to uh, survival data. We have no idea about the component contributions, uh, for example. Then more recently, um, we have some weighted hazard ratio, a weighted composite endpoints, uh, which also allow to include multiple events uh, per subject. But again, we have still the same um, limitations as we had with the extensions of the Cox proportional hazard model. Then there are, of course, some parametric joint modeling um, that is feasible. There is, there's a light green box there somewhere just to say that, of course, we can combine different types of outcome with these uh, joint models. But the more outcomes that we combine, the more complex these models become and the more issues we may encounter with uh, convergence. Um, then there's also some, um, rather recently also, um, a methodology proposed as the average uh, Z-scores. Um, which is a combination also of um, Z-scores per outcome that you then uh, combine. Again, it corrects a few of our concerns, but not all of them. 
And there's also something uh, called uh, desirability of outcome ranking or DOOR, uh, which is based on ranks. So we try to rank uh, subjects based on uh, several outcomes. Um, this looks very similar as uh, General Paywas comparison, but it, there is a, a different, uh, um, a very important difference between the two. Um, also, the methodology, I think, is, is uh, less worked out for uh, component contributions and, and correlations. Um, but you see why we uh, will talk today about general paywall comparisons, um, because I believe it ticks all the boxes or the concerns with the time to first event uh, analysis. And so what is this general paywall comparison? Well, um, it is actually an extension of a non-parametric test that most of you will probably know. Uh, the Mann-Whitney or the Wilcoxon test. Um, so the Mann-Whitney test, you probably know that as a rank test uh, that is available for a single outcome uh, with uncensored data. So what you do is you rank all the observations that you have and then um, compare the the ranks that you have in each of the, the, the treatment outs, uh, arms. Now, ranking, um, what you do actually uh, intuitively is you um, perform a pairwise comparison. So if I would ask you, for example, or a group of people, if I would ask them to rank themselves from um, the smallest to the largest person, um, then what you would do is you would start to do a pairwise comparison. You would look at another person and just compare your height with the height of the other person. And then you know whether you're taller or smaller. Uh, and then you go on to the next person. So what you do is you construct um, some pairwise comparisons and if you compare yourself with each of the other persons, um, then you would know where you rank or where you had to stand. So the man Whitney test, you can just equally well describe with the pairwise comparisons. Um, now, Keen and Gilbert, they um, generalized the man Whitney test, still using um, uh, ranks um, to censored data, because there, there is a, um, a special uh, situation that we need to take care of, uh, namely the censoring. Um, and very recently, uh, by Finkelstein and, and Schoenfeld in 1999, uh, this man Whitney test and Guillen test has been generalized to multivariate uh, outcomes. And then the term itself, a general pay was comparison, was uh, introduced by someone that um, should sound very familiar in uh, in, in this webinar, uh, Mark Baza, uh, in 2010, and then Paul Kakadal uh, introduced a, um, a certain uh, GPC uh, effect measure in the cardiovascular area in 2012, and um, that got a lot of uh, traction since then. So how does the general payroll comparison now work in the context of uh, prioritized multiple outcomes? Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to rank the outcomes that we have by severity. So that means if you have a clinical trial where you have that um, um, myocardial infarction, hospitalization, uh, that you would, um, I guess you would agree with me that we the highest or the most severe event would be that. Next would be myocardial infarction and then uh, hospitalizations. And then we construct pairs, uh, all possible pairs that we can construct between one subject from the treatment group or the new treatment group and one subject from the comparator arm. Uh, and within these pairs, we first uh, we are first going to determine based on the highest ranked outcome, so that in our case, which of the two subjects within the pair is or has the more uh, favorable outcome. So that means the patients that uh, died uh, the latest, if they died at all. If we can do that, uh, then we assign a score, which is based uh, uh, on one or minus one. And so we give a score of one if the new treatment arm is doing better uh, and minus one if the new treatment arm uh, is doing worse. And that means also that the competitor arm wins, of course. If we can do that, for example, if the events are censored, uh, then we have a tie. And then we need to uh, go to the next uh, outcome in our prioritized rank of outcomes. So in our case, that would be myocardial infarction. Again, we try to do the same thing. We try to assign which of the two subjects within the pair 
is doing better on my cardlink function. If we can decide that, then the algorithm stops and we go to the next pair. If we can't, we go to the uh, the last, in our case, uh, outcome, and we try to do the same thing now on hospitalizations. Uh, and if we still can decide which of the two subjects in a pair is doing best, then we end up with a tie. So in the end, what we have is a whole number of wins for the treatment subjects and a whole number of wins for the control subjects and ties. Now, if we take the difference between the number of wins in each treatment arm, then we have the win difference. And that is the statistic that Finkelstein and Schoenfeld have originally presented. Now, unfortunately, this win difference is very difficult to interpret because it depends heavily on the number of pairs that you have. And the number of pairs, they depend on the sample size of your clinical trial. And so that's why Mark Buse, uh, well known, has um, proposed to divide that win difference by the total amount of pairs that you have, which is simply the sum of all uh, the scores that we have, the number of ties, the number of wins in each treatment arm. And that treatment effect is called the net treatment benefit. And because of, we, because of this standardizing, we now have values um, that are taken between minus one and one. And so that means that a positive value means a positive treatment effect uh, of, the, of the new treatment. Uh, negative values are uh, harmful treatments. It's an absolute measure of the treatment effects, and it estimates the probability that a random subject on the new treatment would do better than a random subject on the control treatment minus the reverse. And there is also some additional information that you can get from this net treatment benefit, because if you take the inverse, then you have the number needed to treat. Now we can take the difference of this number of wins, and if we take the ratio, then we have the um, famous win ratio, at least famous in the cardiovascular areas. Now we notice um, that the number of ties are nowhere near uh, in, this, uh, in this formula, um, and, and that is important for the interpretation. We will come back to that uh, later today. So the win ratio is a relative measure of a treatment effect, and it takes values somewhere between minus, uh, sorry, somewhere between zero and uh, infinity. Values above one have a positive treatment effect, below one it's a negative treatment effect. Uh, and as I said, we have to be careful with the interpretation of the win ratio, and, exp and, and we'll go more into detail uh, when we discuss difference between these GPC statistics. And so finally, um, because of uh, the concern about the win ratio um, in the presence of ties, there's also the success odds, that was the latest um, GPC statistic to, to be presented, um, takes account of the number of ties by adding uh, half of the number of ties in each, um, in the numerator and uh, the denominator. Again, this is a relative expression. Um, and it is actually a transformation of the net treatment benefit. Um, and again, uh, because of its ratio, it, it takes values between zero and infinity, values above one positive treatment effect, below one a negative treatment effect. And you can interpret this as an odds. Now we have treatment effect measures, uh, but of course we're interested uh, in analyzing uh, clinical trials. So we need some inferential methodology. And uh, if you go through the, the literature, um, which is quite statistical, uh, then you would see that there are a number of methodologies um, presented or proposed um, for GPC. So we have permutation, bootstrap, rank-based and asymptotic U statistic tests. Um, now the interesting part is that um, for hypothesis testing, you can show that any of the GPC treatment effect measures, then the treatment effect win ratio or the success odds, they will lead to approximately exactly the same p-values. Now, they start to diverge um, the lower that you go with the p-values. So um, the diversion itself will not give you any different results in your analysis. So if you're interested in hypothesis testing, then we should not worry too much about deciding on which of these GPC treatment effects that we should take. Now, where are the differences then between these GPC effect measures um, that I've mentioned? Well, it depends on when you want to report the treatment effects. So here we have an example of two trials, trial one, trial two. 
where we have a number of wins, a number of losses, and a number of ties. And if you look at the first trial, you will see that there are quite a few uh, wins and losses, and um, majority number of ties. In the second trial, we have a lot more wins and losses, and um, the ties are the the yeah, almost the, the smallest portion of the pairs. Now, if you would translate that to the net treatment benefit or the success odds, you would see that in trial one, where there's little evidence for wins and losses and a lot of ties, you will see that the treatment effect, in fact, is quite small. Um, in trial two, you will see because there's less ties and more wins and losses uh, than the treatment effect in, for the net treatment benefit and the success odds is much larger. And this is in contrast to what you would see in the win ratio. The win ratio tells you that the treatment effect is exactly the same in these two trials. While I think you would agree with me that in the first trial, uh, the evidence for a treatment effect seems a lot smaller than in the second trial. And so it's often said that the win ratio in fact is ignoring the number of ties because you don't see number of ties in the formula. Uh, but an alternative interpretation of that would be that the win ratio is not in fact ignoring the number of uh, ties, but is in fact redistributing the number of ties to the observed wins and losses. So that means that for trial one and trial two, we're going to redistribute the number of ties to what we've observed, the three to one ratio in the wins and losses. And so if you do that, you will get something like this. And then uh, if you divide the number of wins by losses, you see you have the win ratio, um, but this corresponds to different net treatment benefits and success odds. And so we'd have to go a bit more into uh, detail about this redistribution of the ties of the win ratio. And we do that by looking at different types of outcomes that we may have. And so we, if we have continuous outcomes, so for example, a relative change in anti-pro BNP, so a marker for heart failure, um, which has been used, for example, in a recent trial called Parachute uh, HF. Then if we look at continuous outcomes, then the chance that we have a tie, the exact same value, that is neg negligible. And so also the problem with redistribution of the ties um, is negligible. And so you can use both net treatment benefit success odds and win ratio. Now a different story we have with discrete outcome data. So discrete data mean, for example, counts, if you look at the number of hospitalizations uh, or categorical outcomes. So for example, um, binary data, yes, no, quality of life categories, um, six minute walk test improvements, for example, these are typically um, captured in categorical outcomes. Now the chance of a tie in these types of data is quite high. Uh, and so what the win ratio says is that, well, we'll distribute the ties according to the win proportions that we've already observed. So that means, for example, if we have a binary outcome data, for example, left ventricle thrombus um, resolution, if both subjects in a pair did not have a resolution or of LVT, uh, then the win ratio will say you, well, it's not a tie. Um, we will just distribute a tie according to what we've already observed. And I think you would agree with me that um, certainly in binary outcome data, this is um, not what the data is telling you. In fact, the data tells you that there is actually a tie in the data. And so it feels incorrect to divide these win proportions, uh, these ties to the win proportions that have already been observed. Now, finally, the survival outcome. There we can have a tie due to two reasons. Either we have an equal time to death or time to event, uh, which is, as the continuous outcome, uncommon. Uh, and the next um, way we can have a tie in survival data is when you have censored observations. So censored observations mean that we do not observe the event because the observation time is too short to observe uh, the event. And that is quite common, of course, in cardiovascular trials. Um, again, the win ratio that will assume that the events that we do not observe will behave exactly the same as the events that we already did observe. So going a bit more into detail, 
Actually, that means that we are under a situation of proportional hazards. So for example, we have a trial uh, uh, with only survival outcomes uh, that we analyze up to one year. Uh, what becomes after one year is censored and that's something that we do not observe. So we have a lot of ties in our data and the win ratio will tell you, well, all those events after one year that we do not observe, we're just going to assume that they will behave exactly the same as we've already observed before one year. So that is actually proportional hazards. And if that is true, um, then you will see that the win ratio at one year or at two year is exactly the same because we just follow the assumption that the win ratio made. In contrast, now we have at one year in the left column exactly the same observation. So the win ratio is ex exactly the same, it's 1.24. But now what comes after one year, what we do not observe, is quite different than before. So here we have a time varying hazard ratio in the top row and crossing hazards uh, in, in, in the bottom row. Now if we assume at one year that the events that we do not observe behave exactly the same as the events that we did observe, then we're making quite a bold assumption. Because if you look at two years, there the win ratio is definitely not the same as the one in the first column. And so for discrete outcomes and survival outcomes, I would want to raise a bit of concern uh, or awareness around over-interpretation of the win ratio. In that case, I think it's better to use the net treatment benefits and the success odds. And so to give you a bit of guidance on which uh, GPC measure to use in cardiovascular trials, um, we've made a guidance uh, that is recently be submitted um, in a, a cardiovascular um, journal. And so that would help you to decide if you want to uh, report a treatment effect, or which uh, GPC treatment measure should I use. So this is one difference between the GPC measures. Another one is uh, something that we've talked before as well, uh, contributions of each of the components in your composite endpoint to the overall outcome. So for GPC, we can actually make a decomposition, if you will, of the overall treatment effects, which is in the bottom uh, row. Um, so we can decompose the effect for each of the components within the composite endpoints. And for the, need, the net treatment benefit, this very nicely gives you um, an idea on which of the components contributed most to the overall treatment effects. So we can very easily see that revascularization contributes the most, followed by myocardial infarction, and then death, and finally stroke. Now, for anything below that in this priority, so anything below the first outcome, you may not interpret the net treatment benefit um, of, the, of all of the components as the treatment effect on these effects, because they are in fact conditional on not being in a tie on the previous levels. So be careful with, uh, with the interpretation uh, of, the, um, of all of the components within the composite endpoint. Now, the nice thing about the treatment benefit is that all of these partial contributions, they simply add up to the overall treatment effects. So you'll see that in the success odds, for example, you can equally get the information of which um, component contributed most to the overall treatment effect. So here again, revascularization, myocardial infarction, then that, and then stroke. Um, but it's not additive. So you cannot add these success odds to come to the overall success odds. And finally, if you look again at the win ratio, uh, again, um, underlining the um, that you need to be careful with over-interpreting the win ratio, there you would see actually the opposite there. Uh, the win ratio tells you that that is contributing most, followed by myocardial, myocardial infarction and then revascularization. Um, but if you look at the, the data itself, the pairs itself, uh, you will see that it's not true. And uh, it's better to look at net treatment benefit and success odds. So these are two differences between these different GPC measures.
Now we're coming to uh, what I at least see as opportunities and challenges uh, of uh, this methodology in cardiovascular trials. Uh, so the first one that I see is that now we can actually analyze the data by severity of the events, rather than just the time to the first event. And so an example is, for example, the matrix trial, uh, which investigated radial or femoral access um, to the coronary arteries um, in uh, patients that had undergo PCI. Um, the study, the original study, in fact, had two co-primary co endpoints looking at the composite of mortality, myocardial infarction, and strokes. Uh, and the second one included also uh, bleeding events, BARC-3 and BARC-5 bleedings. So on the right, you will see the analysis, which were statistically significant, uh, but they looked only at the time to the first event. Now, of course, bleedings are much more frequent and happen more frequently in the trial than, for example, uh, mortality and also stroke and myocardial infarction. Um, and potentially, um, patients had in this trial um, more than one event, uh, and that, in fact, the bleedings may have masked one of the uh, more severe clinical events. Uh, and so it would be interesting to reanalyze the data, but now take account of a certain priority uh, in the events, the severity of the events. Um, so taking this priority um, in the matrix style, we've reanalyzed the data. And so we've looked first at time to death, followed by hemorrhagic stroke. So this is a bark 3 c bleeding. In effect, the bark 5 bleedings were also um, deaths, in fact. Um, after the hemorrhagic stroke, we go to ischemic stroke, then myocardial infarction, uh, then followed by BARC 3A and 3B bleedings. And we can also, for example, include BARC 2 uh, bleedings. And now if we follow this priority of the analysis, if we analyze again the data at um, 30 days, then we'll see that um, there is actually very little difference with a, a classical log rank test, taking the time to first event uh, into account. Um, but the interpretation of the uh, analysis um, satisfies more the clinical reasoning in the sense that now we take the time to the worst event. Now, the matrix itself also had an additional analysis at one year. Uh, and here you see that there is a difference between uh, the time to first event and the time to worst event. Uh, so it may also um, pay to look at the time to worst event, which is clinically also more um, uh, relevant, I would think, than the time to first event. A second opportunity that I see is that now we can include any number and any type of outcome in an analysis. We're not restricted anymore to only survival data. So, for example, in the TAVR onload trial, which is a trial that looked uh, into patients of moderate aortic stenosis uh, with heart failure, um, um, whether or not the uh, transaortic valve replacement um, is beneficial compared to just optimal heart failure therapy. And in order to do so, um, they've looked at survival outcomes, so time to death, time to disabling stroke. But next to that, they also added some categorical uh, and count uh, data. So they also looked at the severity of the stroke, not only the time to the stroke, but also the severity. They have looked at the number of the hospitalizations, the length of the hospitalizations, and the improvement in quality of life, which they believed is one of the main reasons uh, to go for a TAVR uh, compared to just um, the uh, optimal healthcare. Now, the trial itself is still ongoing, so we cannot analyze the data, but we can do simulations. And if we look at the simulations, then we see that if we go through this priority list and analyze with a GPC, um, then that the p-value is smaller than a log rank test, which does not tell you much. But if we do a power analysis uh, of this trial, uh, then you would see that the, the sample size that you would need for a GPC analysis in this context is four times as small uh, as the one that you would need for a lock rank test to get an 80% power detected treatment effect. So that is telling, I think. Now, of course, the lock rank test can only take account of survival data. Um, so, for example, all these um, additional outcomes, such as quality of life, uh, count data, severity of, of an event, um, you cannot take into account in a lock rank. And it does pay off, uh, of course, if there is a treatment effect on uh, one of these outcomes uh, to add it into your. Uh, analyses. 
Now, power is not everything, of course, uh, in uh, an analysis of a clinical trial. Um, so you could tell me now, well, uh, if I just add a lot of um, outcomes in my composite endpoint, then I will increase uh, my power. Um, that's not all, always true, uh, first of all. Uh, and second of all, um, the primary endpoint that you look at or the, the components in your composite endpoint, of course, has to be relevant to the disease that you want to look at. So I just wanted to give you also this uh, important um, warning with, uh, with the GPC. The third one and the last um, opportunity that I see is that, in fact, GPC um, is already known by regulatory authorities. Uh, so very recently, 2019 and 2020, both FDA and EMA has already approved a drug based on a trial with a GPC primary endpoint uh, in cardiology, by the way. So this is the first uh, drug that has been approved with uh, a GPC uh, analysis um, in amyloid cardiomyopathy. I think that's also an, uh, an opportunity. So it is recognized already by the regulatory authorities. Now, of course, there is also some uh, some challenges. And so it's a non-parametric methodology. So um, adjustments for baseline covariance is um, challenging. Uh, so for now, we can correct for some covariance through stratifications. So you have to know the baseline um, covariates or the covariates at least um, the start of the study uh, and then you co can correct for them by stratification of course that is then limited in the number of covariates that you can correct for uh, and of course you have to make sure that the strata itself are uh, sufficiently large to be able to get um, a reliable result in your analysis um, now there is also um, there are actually a few uh, people that are uh, investigating regression models with GPC. Uh, so hopefully in the in the near future uh, we would be able to uh, just use a regression and be able to correct for any covariates that we wish for with GPC. A second challenge is um, that GPC itself is in fact a superiority analysis, um, and we cannot, at least uh, if you don't want to specify a margin on net treatment benefit, for example, we cannot uh, perform a non-inferiority non uh, analysis. Um, now, I always, always uh, tell cardiologists if they contact me that, well, there is a possibility to do a superiority trial with a non-inferiority flavor, uh, which is the threshold. So within a pairwise comparison, if you compare two subjects in a pair, what you can do is you can say, well, I will say that one subject is doing better than the other only if, for example, the time to death is different than more than two weeks, for example. So if they die within two weeks of one another, then there isn't really any difference between them. And so this is also a non-inferiority margin, if you will, on the level of the pairwise comparison. So you can define them for each of the components in your composite endpoint, and then you still do a superiority trial, but it has a non-inferiority flavor. So to conclude, I think GPC is a very flexible statistical methodology that allows you to take the severity of clinical events into account when, once you have multivariate outcomes. Um, it also allows you to include all clinical meaningful outcomes, including quality of life, survival outcomes in a single analysis. So we com can combine any number and any type of outcome in a single analysis. You don't have to choose between GPC measures if you're interested in hypothesis tests because they will lead to equal p-values. But if you want to report the clinical treatment effects, then you should be careful to choose um, one of these GPC measures with um, the comments that I, that I made before. We also get an, um, an idea about the contribution of each of the components to the overall results, most specifically with the net treatment benefits. It does take account of the correlation between the components, so your net treatment benefits will change in value uh, depending on the correlation between the components, and that may be interesting in benefit risk assessment. I didn't go into detail uh, in this presentation on this, but there is some literature I can point you to. The GPC may increase the power compared to other tests. 
uh, but of course, taking also the comment into mind of uh, Stevenson about power is not the most important one. You, of course, want to have a measure that is clinically revel relevant. And finally, um, there are some software available, uh, most notably an, an R package is available, Bausetest, um, for example, and there are some SAS um, programs also available uh, in different um, published literature. And so this is what I wanted to talk to you today, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Great, thank you very much, Johan. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I'll jump in really quickly here. Um, this is the Q&A portion of our uh, webinar. So if you do want to submit questions, please do so in the questions panel. I know we already have a few questions already, so we can start going through those. Um, and yeah, so I'll leave the floor to you both. Thank you. All right, um, so I will be indeed um, moderating the, the questions and I, I see that we have um, a couple of them. Um, so um, the first one is um, about the, um, well, the interpretation of the uh, influence of uh, components in this um, GPC methodology. So um, the question goes as follows, Johan, since the wind ratio is behaving opposite to the net treatment benefits and success odds, I, I guess that's uh, related to your, your example that you showed. Does that mean that the win ratio gives more weight to highest ranked outcomes in terms of severity and not necessarily the contribution to the composite outcome? Um, no, so uh, in fact, the it's, it's just a, a hazard, in fact, that it's just the opposite for the win ratio than the net treatment benefit and the success odds in this example. So it's not always uh, like this. Um, I can also show you examples where uh, it is not exactly the opposite. So um, I don't. The win ratio does not weigh more uh, the first events uh, compared to net treatment benefit and success odds. It all has to do with this uh, number of ties that are being redistributed. So uh, the fact that you just saw in the example that I showed you the opposite is just um, coincidence, in fact. Hmm. Okay, great. Um, another question is um, about the fact so um, that uh, the way we order the severity ranking will influence the, the treatment effects. Um, a question about that is, um, is this a, a fair assumption? Is there a way to make it more robust to this priority ranking when, or defined empirically? Um, so it's a, it's a um, like, this fast question here about the ordering of, of the outcomes. Yeah, so that's indeed true. Eh? So if you uh, order your events differently, then you may end up with different results. Um, you have to make some decisions um, somewhere, somehow uh, in a primary analysis. Um, I would say the benefit in fact of GPC is that it allows you also to uh, take a different priority. Uh, so for example, authorities, uh, clinicians, uh, patients may have a different view on which of the events are most important and which are least important. Uh, and so this GPC allows you to evaluate uh, the, the data that you have uh, in different ways uh, for different opinions. So it may be a benefit actually to be able to do this because if you look at the time to first event well it's always the same analysis um, which of course is important uh, if you want to um, register um, um, for, for drug approval um, but we just need to agree on the priority of, uh, of the events um, and I think among clinicians and among authorities um, mostly there will be very little discussion on which of these events are most important. Um, I think perhaps mostly with uh, patients, you might disagree on that. Um, so in terms of regulatory approval, um, I don't think there's uh, a, a big issue um, with prioritizing the events. All right, great. Um, so um, another question. Um, so um, suppose I, uh, well, as as you've shown, the um, there's a, a positive um, response from the, the regulators uh, as there's already uh, some acceptance uh, using GPC as as a primary endpoint for a, for a new drug. I suppose now I, I want to conduct myself a, 
a, a new trial using GPC, what are the, the key elements I should uh, take into account for, for example, uh, sample size determination? Yeah, so the sample size determination um, is, well, there exist a few closed form formulas, uh, but they are usually restricted to certain scenarios. So that means that you can only take maximum of two uh, outcomes, um, for example. Um, so in most generally, uh, you need to resort to simulations if you wanted to sample size calculations. Um, and in order to do these sample size uh, simulations or the simulations to get the sample size uh, calculation, you need a few um, parts. So you need, in fact, event rates, uh, expected event rates in um, the control arm uh, for the population that you look at uh, and expected uh, treatment effects on each of the components um, in your composite endpoint. Ideally, you would also have information around correlation between these components, because as, as I told you, the correlation do does play a, a role in the GPC analysis. Um, so ideally, you would have somehow a data set where you can estimate also the correlation between the components. Um, if that is not present, um, then you, know, you would have to make some assumptions uh, there as well. Um, so you would need, compared perhaps to other um, methods of analysis, you need a bit more information. Uh, so rather than just a time to first event where you, where you just need uh, event rate, hazard ratio, um, and that's it, you would now need to get a bit more information on each of the components that you have, including the correlation. And so sample size determination is a bit more involved than um, with uh, at least a time to first event analysis. Mm. All right. Um, another question um, about um, disease free survival. So in oncology, DFS is a, is a composite endpoint, but it's um, never analyzed with the GPC methods, while it might better capture the whole outcome, so death being worse than, than recurrence. Um, are you aware of any attempt of using GPC methods with DFS and whether that made a difference in interpretation or are to, is that not um, out there in your uh, to the limit of your knowledge? It is definitely out there. Um, so, as said by by Michael before, um, my main at least the main applications that I look at uh, is in cardiovascular trials and, and rare diseases. Um, but I know also, um, and and Michael can perhaps add there as well, um, because they at IDDI I look uh, more at uh, at oncology trials, for example. I know there are a few applications uh, of GPC in oncology trials. So mostly re analysis of data, um, where they indeed uh, look at uh, overall survival first and then uh, progression-free survival. So that is definitely out there. I think um, you would have to look in the literature mainly for the name of um, Julien Perron. Um, so he's uh, an oncologist in France who has done quite a lot of research as well uh, applied to oncology trials. So if you look for that name, uh, in the literature, you will find some reanalysis of oncology trials um, with GPC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Oncology is um, indeed a, a domain where um, death before progression is just makes uh, sense. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for yeah, it, it just uh, happened to have a lot of traction in, in cardiology. So the most applied papers on GPC you will find in the cardiovascular area. Um, but I think there are also some uh, very interesting um, applications in oncology, mainly as, uh, as what, what I've mentioned uh, as one, on one of the last, slide, last, last slides is uh, on uh, benefit risk assessment. So um, toxicology versus the benefit of an oncology uh, treatment. Um, so there, there's also some uh, interesting applications there. Mm -hmm. um... Another question, uh, more perhaps technical one, um, about uh, in terms of competing risk analysis, how, how does um, GPC uh, work in, in that context? Um, 
That's a good question. And it's also been uh, methodologically also been investigated. Um, I think it's also, it has been part as well of the, uh, the benefit uh, research consortium as uh, Michael stated at the beginning. Uh, and so there is a paper um, of the first author, Kantagayo, um, who describes methodology uh, for competing risks uh, in the presence of GPC. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, there's also the software is available within the Bowser test package uh, on these competing risks. Mm, exactly. Exactly. Um, another question uh, is about the um, estimate framework. Um, no, not sure how comfortable uh, you are in for that one, but the question is, how does GPC fit into the estimate framework for ICH E9 addendum? Um, for instance, for GPC, there is no summary measure for each treatment norm and so on. And um, uh, uh, thank you in the comment for your very clear presentation already. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you. Um, second, uh, estimate framework um, is uh, it's it's interesting. Um, so, to be honest, it's something that we still need to look into. Um, there has been uh, behind the screen a lot of discussions about uh, estimates and what the estimate is exactly uh, in in a prioritized GPC. Um, so for now, um, I. I cannot uh, point you to any relevant literature on this uh, because it simply has not been uh, investigated yet. Um, but it, uh, it would be very interesting to, uh, to dive deeper into, uh, into this uh, to relate GPC to the estimate framework. But for now, I, unfortunately, I cannot give you much more uh, information on this. It's still, um, I think, a topic to research, an interesting topic to research. Okay, um, now a very pertinent, well, they are pertinent, of course, uh, but a, a, a very uh, a pertinent one um, about the influence of, of time. So um, isn't the GPC method sensitive to the uh, timing of analysis? In analysis, after one year, the number of deaths would be small compared to a situation after five years, for, for instance, in, in oncology trial. Uh, isn't that a disadvantage uh, of the method? Well, to be honest, any analysis in survival data is sensitive to time. Uh, also the time to first event uh, analysis, as I've, I've shown you, unless you assume proportional hazards and that is actually a, a true assumption. Um, so as, as I've shown, um, the win ratio itself, and, uh, and if you have a single uh, outcome, then the win ratio is the inverse of uh, the, the hazard ratio. Um, then uh, the hazard ratio itself is also time sensitive unless you have proportional hazards. Um, the only difference is if you would, for example, look at the time to first event, uh, time to first event analysis, and you would analyze um, at one year, analyze again at five years, then uh, most of the events will still be the least clinically interesting ones because you only look at the time to first event. Now, in contrast with GPC, if you analyze at first event or at, uh, at one year or at five years, you look at the worst event. And so your analysis moves um, at one year where you have perhaps more uh, least important events, it will move in five years to the, the harder clinical endpoints. Uh, and so you would end up if you would draw this uh, eternally, you would end up with just a mortality analysis. And I think that is actually a benefit from GPC compared to a time to first event, because if you analyze uh, time to first event uh, or you composite an endpoint with a time to first event analysis, if you would analyze it um, within 20, 30 years, you would still uh, not have a mortality analysis. And I think in cardiology, uh, trials, the most interesting endpoint, as at least that's where we started from, um, is mortality. And so with GPC, if you analyze over time, you would have more and more um, mortality in the data and more and more of the evidence will come from mortality data. Very, uh, very interesting, very clear. Um, uh, I think, Kelsey, there are still a couple couple of questions, um, but I think we're reaching yeah. the, the end of the session. I just want to, uh, before we uh, 
to say goodbye, I just want to thank, of course, Johan very, very warmly for his, as ever, very pedagogical uh, presentation. Um, as a true gift for presentations, it's a, it's a real pleasure to, to listen to. Uh, thank you again, Johan, for, for your contribution today. Thank you for having me. Yes, and thank you both very, very much. Um, Johan, you had an excellent presentation. And I just wanted to thank the audience as well for participating. And you know, for those who we couldn't get to your questions, we'll follow up after the presentation. And please feel free to send further questions if you have any to info at IDDI.com. That's I-N-F-O at IDDI.com. Uh, you'll also be receiving a follow-up email from us with access to the archived uh, version of this webinar, so you can review it later on as well. Um, and you'll also be receiving a survey window um, on your screen once the webinar closes. So if you could fill that in, that would just help us improve on future webinars as well. Um, thank you both, though, uh, to our speakers today. Uh, thank you, Johan. Thank you, Mikhail. Thank you very much. And um, thank you to our audience for, for participating. So uh, it's been a pleasure. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.